Okay. So it looks like all our friends are here. So I'm going to turn it over to our great connected friend, Lannis, who's going to talk to us for about 40 minutes about owls. But this is a really interesting session because it's owls from the inside out. So I'm really looking forward to seeing this. And I'm going to turn it right over to you, Lannis. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, thank you, of course, everybody for participating. And a hello to you all from Ann Arbor, Michigan. At least that's where I am in currently. And as mentioned, my name is Lannis, and I'm from a place called the Leslie Science and Nature Center. Now, uh, most of my job actually revolves around taking care of the animals that we have here in the nature center. But the cool thing is that a lot of these animals also go through training to be teachers. So then we can do things like workshops just like this, where you guys can meet some of these live animals up close, as well as learning a little bit about them. And today, as already mentioned, you may already know, we are diving into the world of owls, both from the inside and from the out. Today, you're gonna get the chance to meet two live owls up close. And towards the end, we're actually gonna do a little bit of experiment and look inside something from an owl that some of you might be familiar with. But before we meet the owls and really talk about owls, we have to figure out how can we tell owls apart from other creatures, how we identify them. The owls are what we call raptors or birds of prey. Um, other birds such as vultures or hawks, falcons, eagles, they all fall into this category too. And there's usually uh, two main characteristics or physical features that we as scientists use to help identify these birds from others. I actually have another camera that I can use though and show you it up close. Let's make sure that this works to share our screen so you can see. Ready, go. Ah, perfect. Okay, so what you're probably seeing are these two objects under here. And what you're going to notice is one are these four sharp curved talons. Um, I actually can also show you here. And these guys, these four sharp curved talons or toenails you see on the owl foot, that's kind of the owl's primary hunting device. This is how they're able to grab or grip onto their food. That word raptor actually means to grab stuff. But what this foot doesn't show you is just how powerful it is. See, those four sharp curved talons are great at holding on to larger, stronger food. But owls and raptors are so powerful themselves that they can actually break the bones of the prey that they eat. What that means is that they have a strong enough grip strength. You humans, you can actually take your hand, you can squeeze it really hard. That's your grip strength. Sometimes you're strong enough to break a pencil if you don't. Or maybe you're strong enough to break a toothpick. Well, for these animals, for these owls, they're strong enough to break the bones of their food. There's another thing though that you can see on our screen too, and that's the beak or the whole face of the owl probably. I'm gonna go back to our other camera here so we can look at this one closely too. So we're looking at the skull as we call it of an owl. And what I want you guys to look at is kind of painted black on here too. And that is basically the, the beak or overall shape of the beak of these owls. Now, the cool thing is that as scientists, we typically look at a bird's beak to tell how or what it eats. And you can probably notice that from the shape and the size, it's kind of similar to those four sharp curved talons, mostly meaning that this is from an animal that eats primarily meat. These guys are amazing carnivores, but they don't have any teeth. So owls and birds in general have to rely on the shape or size of their beak to help eat their primary prey. Also, it kind of helps like a, a knife and fork combo, being able to cut up your food into smaller bits while using that talon and beak combo. Now, those specimens are great. Don't get me wrong. I love looking at them too. But sometimes the best way to learn about owls is to actually just meet one. So let's do it. The owls are sitting right next to me, so I'll make sure that I grab them. This first one, though, is pretty common, not only here in Michigan, but actually throughout most of the territories in Canada. And the great thing is, is a lot of us either know this owl by its shape, its appearance, or sometimes its call. But don't be fooled. This owl's going to be a little small to start with. Doesn't mean she's any less of a ferocious predator. And here's what I need you to do. When you're watching this owl, not only do you want to look for those physical features we talked about to identify her as a raptor, 
You also want to be able to see specific things that help you identify her as an owl. Ready? Let's take a closer look. For some of the folks in the chat that are noticing our screen is blurry, it might be a connection issue. Sometimes, I don't know, you might need to reconnect or restart. Sometimes it happens with my computer too. But check it out. I'll make sure that folks can see her really well. Even though she's small, remember she's ferocious. She's actually our second smallest owl that we have here in Michigan. She's what we call an Eastern Screech Owl. Now, Eastern Screech Owls typically come in two colors. I know she's really cute. I see a lot of reactions about it. I find most people think owls are cute. It's very true. But uh, Eastern Screech Owls, we can sometimes find them in what we call our rufous or our red phase. That's what she is. She actually has most of this red plumage or feather pattern along her body with a combination of black and white stripes as well. You can also find them in what we call a gray phase or a gray morph, where basically just replace all these red feathers with dark gray or sometimes black as well. But the best thing too for her is we can use her to help talk about those other physical features we see on our owls. For example, first thing I notice when I look at this owl is that her eyes are ginormous. Owl eyes are huge. In fact, if we go back to that skull and we take a closer look, you can actually see the holes or the eye sockets where the owl eyes sit. The thing from there is that owls, not only are their eyes ginormous, they sit really far back into their face. So not only are they giant, they're long. In fact, if we humans were the size of owls, our eyes would actually be the size of tennis balls. See, we would be looking at each other with tennis balls on our face, which probably would be a little ridiculous for a human, but for an owl, that's incredibly important. Owls are what we classify as nocturnal species, meaning they're most active or they typically hunt in the dark, in the night. And having larger eyes actually means that you can take in smaller amounts of light really easily, just from the moon and the stars, perhaps. So a lot of nocturnal animals, owls included, will usually have those larger eyes thanks to being able just to take those tiny amounts of light to see the details on the ground. But there's a disadvantage. See, owl eyes, they're so big, they're stuck. They're actually stuck inside an owl's head. Here, remember this thing? We talked about how it goes really far back into their face. Well, even though an owl's eyes are in the shape of tubes, they're actually stuck inside these holes, meaning an owl can't actually move their eyes like we humans can. See, we could sit here, and as a human, we could keep our head perfectly still, and we could take our eyes and look left, or right, or up, or down, super easy for a human, but that's because our eyes can move independently from other parts of our body. She can't. She has to turn her head in order to see. And when they do it, they kind of look like robots. Now, I can't force her to turn her head around, but I can still show you how it works. We're just going to use the skull instead. Let's say that this owl, say it can start by looking straight at you. What it will do is it'll take its head and turn it over its shoulder about 90 degrees, kind of like we humans can. And then from there, I can keep going behind it to look at me, that's 180 degrees. And then it can keep going and go up to 270 degrees. And then it has to come all the way back to look at you. Now, that means that owls can turn their head about 270 degrees around their body. <laughs> and then somebody go, oh, that's kind of interesting. It is a very strange adaptation, but that's not it. See owls? They can also take their head, watch close, and they can tilt it side to side. Or my personal favorite, they can take their head and they can flip it upside down and backwards. And they can look at me upside down. Now, I know I actually find a lot of humans try that or they try to bend their head backwards and my shoulders get in the way. Uh, try this instead though. Go ahead and take a couple fingers like this. And if you find your neck bones here in the back, uh, we humans, we have seven neck bones or seven cervic vertebra, we call it. And we actually have the same number of neck bones as a giraffe has, which is pretty cool. But we don't have as many neck bones as this owl has. And I know she doesn't even really look like she has a neck. Well, this owl has 14 neck bones. 
14 neck bones. That is seven more neck bones than all of us humans have. And the crazy thing is, is her neck is actually in the shape of the letter U. It's curved, just like that letter, almost in the, her body, which gives her that really hunched over appearance. And so the cool thing then is that it allows her to tilt, twist, and turn her head all these crazy directions without having to move the rest of her body, kind of making her look like a robot in a way. Now, great thing about owls is that usually we can tell where they live or their habitat, habitat based on their camouflage, or at least their feather patterns and things that we see that help them blend in in their environment. So what I'm noticing with this kind of owl is she kind of has this tree-like or tree bark appearance, if you will. The cool thing is, is thanks to that camouflage though, even smaller owls can stay protected from other predators. Because while she is a predator, it's true, there are other owls that eat this owl. So camouflage becomes especially important, no matter if you are the tallest owl out there or even a small one too. Whether it's being sneaky for other prey items that you're looking for or hiding from other predators. The cool thing is, is owls, their camouflage is sometimes so good, not even we humans can see them. So we're gonna try a little bit of an experiment. What I'm gonna do is, well, I can't bring a tree in here because trees are heavy. So what I can do instead though, is I do have pictures of owls kind of using their camouflage to the best of their ability. And I'm gonna need your help. When I show you an image or I show you a picture of an owl using its camouflage, I know I can't see you, but I still want you to participate. You can either go ahead and put your thumbs up, see if you can find an owl or more in one picture. I'm going to put her away so we can still see it. Or better yet, if you have folks that are in the same room as you, you can talk amongst yourself and see if you can picture or point out where the owl is going to be. Let's start with an easier one, though. What I'll do is I'll hold up this image to our camera and see if folks can see it. You also can participate in the chat room if that helps too. Ready? See if you can find an owl in this picture. Mm, okay, I'll even be nice and I'll bring it a little closer to the camera. Oh, see if some folks from there too. Yep, oh, I said someone said that they found it. That's awesome, perfect. Just come a little closer, thinking about where the owl might sit in its habitat too is always really helpful. For that as well. <laughs> I have folks that are really excited about finding. It. Okay, I'll even make it harder and I'll go back. Okay, perfect, perfect. I see a lot of participation. I love it. Now, like I said, this one's a little easier, but this is what amazes me. This owl is not a chameleon. Like it doesn't just change its feather color whenever it wants. It blends in perfectly with the tree. And I'll take my finger and I'll show you. It's right smack dab in the center. Now, this is Michigan's tallest owl. This is an owl we call a great gray owl. And usually the first thing that I notice is that it has these two yellowish eyes. They're little bats that make it look like a tree with eyes. Eventually you might see that the head is really round too, but check out the belly patterns that are on there. It's basically made to camouflage with this tree. And owls, owls can't see color. So it's not like it knows the exact color of this tree trunk. What it does know is by instinct that it blends in with different tree species and therefore can stand there and look just like a tree. Okay, that one was a pretty easy one. We'll try one more. What I love about this next picture is there's something specific about the owl's eyes that make it amazing at camouflaging. Okay, you guys ready? See if you guys can find the owl in this picture. I'll bring it up. We'll even bring it a little closer for folks. Oh, I've got a couple of folks that say they can see it. Excellent. Janice, you could even try to put it under your document camera. That might work too. Yeah, I am trying to make it work. My document camera is shut off, so it's actually oh. starting right now, which is why we're doing it. Nice. Thank you for the suggestion. Okay. We're slowly getting into work again. But if it does work before we move on to our next activity, I'll make sure to do so. Bring a little closer. Excellent. Oh, I see a couple other folks that said they found it too. I'll even bring it downwards. I'm going to make it a little easier for you guys just because I'm nice. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. 
But this is an owl who's actually named for his camouflage. It's an owl we call a barred owl. These excellent uh, stripes or bars along its belly has a great who cooks for you call. And from there, the best part is like our first owl, it's also gonna be sitting directly in the center of the tree. What I love about this picture though, that this owl's eyes are dark. They're black or a blackish tint. From there, what that means is that it's expert camouflage, if you will, is to be able to keep its eyes open while it's still in the shade, which is great because this owl tends to live really deep in the wooded spaces where it's almost always darker. A lot of owls tend to have a yellow or orange tinted iris around their eye, which means when they camouflage, they usually have to close their eyes to better blend in. But for something like this owl that has a darker eye color to begin with, that just means it can leave its eyes open and continuing to scan the world and ground around it while still remaining camouflaged. Now, our second owl that we're going to go ahead and we're going to meet next, it's pretty unique because it's going to look a little different from the first owl that we've met today. However, mostly because it's a different species. So let's do this. Let's see, we'll grab this guy, if we can find some of those physical differences. The other cool thing is that this guy has a great way of showing you one key nocturnal feature that ends up happening to deal with an owl's eyes. Hold on, buddy. I know you're very excited to get out here. Let's see if we can discover our next owl species. Now, I know I said owls are nocturnal, but these guys are almost always active during the day while they're here. Might be because their feeding schedule is sometimes during the day. I know, buddy. First things first, he's a lot bigger. <laughs> I love the reactions that I see in there too. That's great. This kind of owl is actually the same kind that we were seeing in our second camouflage picture. He's called a barred owl. And barred owls are just a larger species than screech owls. And so if folks weren't sure, weren't quite sure what kind it is, just it's a different species. And you're seeing that darker eye color, which is amazing. But there's a couple other differences we can note. One, yes, it's camouflage, it's excellent for the trees. But it also has a really different shape than our first owl. Its face looks kind of more like a circle, or it's very round. He also moves his head a lot more too, so you see that robotic nature. I see somebody says that this is their favorite owl. That's awesome. What I love about this owl is that we can actually look at the shape of his face to talk about an owl's best sense, and that's not their sense of sight. It's their sense of hearing. What if I told you that owls can actually hear better than they can see? And that's saying something because owls can see almost perfectly well with just the moon and the stars. But here's the thing. The moon and the stars, they're not always out and about. Or sometimes it's too dark and this owl can actually see its food. So what it does instead is it can use its sense of hearing to still pinpoint the location of its food without even having to see it. In fact, this owl is so good at hunting with a sense of hearing, he can hunt for mice under the snow. He doesn't even have to see his food moving. He can pinpoint the exact location. Now, here's how it works. What's going on is that with these guys, they have a, a unique round bowl shaped face, almost like a satellite dish. And that helps to bring sound closer to his ears. His face is also kind of smooshed or kind of flat, if you will. Well, that flat shaped face allows sound to come closer to their ears too. Uh, for example, we humans, we have this giant nose that's in our way. And so when sound comes to us, it boop, hits our nose first before it gets to our ears. Now, you can't see his ears, they're, they're tucked away and these feathers here on the side, but his ears are also in a very strange place. One of his ears sits boop, up here. The other ear sits boop, down here. Their ears are lopsided. They could never wear glasses because their glasses would always fall off. I mean, luckily most owls don't need to wear glasses, but his ears are lopsided. Now that's great because that helps him pinpoint the location of sounds all over the place. For example, this ear up here listens for the uh, tiniest scurry around of other predators, maybe other owls. And then this ear down here listens for the pitter patter of different rodents or other animals underneath the leaf litter or in the grass. 
to the point that when this guy is actually hunting for his food, they take their talons and their feet and they bring their feet up to their ears because they're using their sense of hearing to pinpoint the exact location where to strike. So they don't even need light anymore to be able to hunt their food. All they need to be able to do is hear it. And their hearing, mind you, is way better than ours. Now, one of the cool features we can talk about with this guy um, is something that we see in a lot of nocturnal animals, but can't only see it because of their eye color. Because his eyes are dark, though, watch close. Ever so often, because he is turning his head quite a bit, when he moves, oh, he just did it. When he moves his head, he blinks. And the cool thing is, is when you watch him blink, it almost looks like his eyes, oh, he did it again, turn the color blue. His eyes aren't changing color, though. Owls have three eyelids. See, we humans, we have two, one up top, one on the bottom. And then these guys, their third one goes er, 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 side to side like the windshield wiper on a car. And it's this really cloudy bluish color. Why? So he can see all of you when he blinks. A lot of other nocturnal creatures have this too, like cats or crocodiles and alligators. And what's great is that he can use, oh, he did it again, oh my gosh. He can use that third eyelid to keep his eye clean and clear while he's just about to hunt for his prey meaning that he can still keep his eye on his prey 100% before even having to strike. It would be amazing to use because then nobody would know that we were looking at them, even though we use the third eyelid like this. It's awesome. And thankfully, because his eyes are darker, we can see it better. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but the whole time these owls have been out, they've also been really quiet. Now, owls are, are pretty sneaky animals on purpose. It's a lot quieter in the evening, or sometimes they're animals that they eat, that they prey upon, has an amazing sense of hearing. But owls excel at being so sneaky. Oh, that's a great way to turn his head. Nice job, dude. They're so sneaky, sometimes we humans can't even hear them. Now, a lot of the prey that they eat are things like rodents that typically have larger ears, um, other things like rabbits or squirrels, even skunks sometimes because owls can't actually smell their food. But it pays to be sneaky because owls are not very fast, especially when they fly. Compared to something like a hawk or a falcon, these guys are some of the slowest raptors. But that's because all they have to focus on is being quiet. It's also important to note, too, that this owl is with me not because he's my pet. Owls don't make good pets. In fact, where I live, it's against the law to have an owl as a pet. But he is with us because of an injury. Uh, here at the Leslie Science Nature Center, we have different birds of prey, mostly because they have an injury to where they cannot be released into the wild. What that means then is that because they're permanent residents with us, we try our best to turn them into teachers. So that way they can teach folks just like you about owls we have here and how we can better interact with them in the wild. His injury, the best way to describe it is that this is a very forgetful owl. He has something we call a closed head injury or a brain injury. And from there, there's a lot of things that he should be paying attention to that he just doesn't. For example, this kind of owl, barred owls, they have a call that sounds like the words, who cooks for you? Well, he'll do the who cooks? never finishes his sentences. He never finishes his call. And as an owl, you need to make sure you're saying everything you need to to warn other owls where your territory is, or better yet, to find a mate. So that's one of the many reasons that he is with us. But he's doing a great job at showing you the sneakiness. Now, I can't force this owl to fly, but I do have another experiment we want to discover. And that's exactly what happens when owls fly because they're so quiet, not even we can uh, hear them. And I have two objects to be able to do so. I'm gonna use both my hands though, so we're gonna go ahead and put this guy away. And here's what I want you guys to do. What happens is I'm gonna try to be a bird and I'm gonna try to flap the two objects that I have. Mind you, I'm not a bird, so we'll see how this goes. And see if I can make any noise with those two objects. What I want your help with, kind of similar to what we did for the camouflage activity, is we're going to see if you guys can hear anything or any of the noises that I use. Now, one of the objects that I have is actually from an owl. The other one, though, is just going to be from a different kind of raptor. Um, let's start with the, oop, uh-oh, am I still here? My thing just froze. I can hear you, but you're frozen for me. 
Yeah, and we and yep. and Linus, we just want to say something to the students real quick. Yeah, for sure. We'll see if my uh, camera will come back. Okay. So students, we're really happy that you're all together in as a class in here. But if you can keep the chat to what we as teachers call on task talk, um, because we're trying to monitor for questions um, and comments for Lannis. So things about the owls is great and things about uh, what you're learning. But if we can keep if we can just keep the task to about uh, the talk to about the owls and then you guys can find different ways to talk amongst yourselves when we're not doing a session. Thanks. Very fun to talk to others. I definitely get it, but owls are just as cool too. Okay, now that we're back, here's what we're gonna do. I have one feather here that I'm gonna flat first, just one feather, so we'll see how much noise it makes. Go ahead, listen close. You can even come closer to your speaker if you need to, and see if you can hear anything from the thing that I flat. Ready? Okay, here we go. Whoa. I heard that. Here, flat. Holy cow. I don't know about you guys, but this one feather is making a ton of noise. Oh my goodness, you might even have some folks saying, oh yeah, I totally heard this. Now, I have to admit, it's very loud, especially when it's close to the speaker. <laughs> I have to admit, this is not from an owl. This is from a much larger kind of raptor. This is from a raptor we call a turkey vulture. And turkey vultures are these amazingly large black raptors with these ginormous wingspans about five and a half feet long. And they sit there and they teeter totter in the sky and they're looking for dead stuff. They're scavengers, they eat dead animals. And so then uh, if you're eating something that isn't alive anymore, does that mean you have to be really sneaky or quiet? And so you sneak up on your food before it runs away? Nope, definitely not. Your food's not going to go anywhere. So because turkey vultures will eat dead stuff, they can be as loud as they need to be. Think if you had 50 of these one feathers on a whole wing of a turkey vulture. They kind of sound like mini airplanes when they take off. And so from there, that flapping doesn't bother their prey because their prey is just not going to move anymore too. Turkey vultures, very loud. So from there though, owls, we know they eat live prey, so it's gotta be a little bit of a different story. I had the whole wing though from an owl. This is from an owl we call great horned owl. It's got a lot more feathers, so it should make a lot more noise. Let's try. See if I can use my flapping skills and see if you guys can hear any noise from this whole wing. Here we go. Wait a minute. I'll try again. Okay, I'll try even harder, okay? Man, it's a lot of work being able to flap this whole wing. But I don't know about you guys. I'm actually seeing in our chat, yeah, right? We're not hearing even near as much sound from this whole wing full of feathers versus that from one. Well, there is a secret feature, my friends, and a lot of it has to deal with the texture, but also what's happening on the feathers. Here, check it out. So we have our turkey vulture feather, right? You actually can see it really well. It's taller than my face. But what you're gonna notice is that it has these really straight lines along the side, and it's a very stiff feather. Meaning when I flap it, what's happening is the stiffness and these really smooth edges cause that swoosh noise that you hear as air hits this feather. And since all the turkey vulture feathers have this stiff but smooth lined appearance, that allows them then to just be a little bit louder, but also helps them to soar better in the air. An owl, though, their feathers are incredibly soft, and the wing shape is different than some other raptors, which makes owls pretty slow. But on the edge of the wing and on the edge of these feathers, they're the little, little tiny frayed edges, almost looks like somebody took scissors to this wing and cut little eyelash edges on it to the point that when air goes through those feathers and can go through the feathers here really easily because the feathers are so thin, it makes a really, really high pitched noise. So high, not even we humans can hear it. We can't hear owls when they flap their wings. Owls aren't silent per se, but they're just making noise that's too high for us to hear. 
there's another animal that can't hear it. Mice. Mice can't hear owls when they fly. So from there, a mouse becomes an amazing part of an owl's diet. Now I know there is one question I can answer right away. We'll save some other ones till the end. Someone was asking how we got these. These were actually, or parts of them were donated to us. Some of them are also from the raptors we have here at the nature center. We have to have a special permit, a special license to actually have these specimens at the nature center. So this turkey vulture feather actually was from one of our turkey vultures that molted it or shed it off. But to use it for education, I have to have a license to be able to hold this in my hand and use it in a program. Same thing with the owl wing and a lot of the other specimens that we're seeing. Good question though, because they are pretty cool to see up close. But next, what we gotta talk about is what happens when owls eat their food. See, we know owls are predators and they're great hunters and they have these amazing talents, sure. But when they actually catch something, then what happens? Well, here's the cool part. We are gonna do another little experiment about something from an owl we call an owl pellet. And what I wanna do, so I want to take you on a little bit of a, a journey here through what happens when an owl catches its prey. Um, let's say, for example, we have a mouse in a forest minding its own business. And then we have an owl that comes nearby, grabs that mouse and goop, swallows it whole. Well, owls, when they eat and digest their food, they have not one, but two stomachs. Two stomachs. Most birds, in fact, have two stomachs, which means there's a lot that has to happen within the owl's digestive system to produce something called a pellet. Now, an owl, I'm gonna use just a picture and kind of take away all the other organs except the two stomachs. What happens is this. We talk about an owl's anatomy. When a mouse goes down into, say, the first clump here, that's the blue clump, that's the owl's first stomach, or what we call the proventriculus. You can also just call it the first stomach too. And this is where some of the mouse bits, if you will, start to get broken up into smaller pieces. Then its food is gonna to start to travel down into this pink blob. That's its second stomach. You can also call it the ventriculus. Now, the second stomach is pink because it kind of acts like a muscle. It helps filter out and break down parts of the owl's food that it can digest and can't. And if we think about mm, pieces of a mouse, if you will, we can actually look at it and determine what owl can and can't eat because it can't actually eat all parts of a mouse. For example, let's imagine the uh, mushy, gooey stuff like the blood or the organs, the tissues and the muscles of a mouse. That is amazing for an owl. That's the perfect nutrients that it needs. Lots of protein, iron, other great meaty snacks that it loves. The mushy gooey stuff, excellent for an owl. But then you have the leftovers like the fur if it's a mouse or maybe the feathers if it's a bird, the toenails, the tail, or all the skeletal bones that are in it too. That an owl cannot digest. So what happens is that in that first stomach, that blue blob that you see, the proventriculus, all the things that an owl can't digest goes back up into that first stomach. And when that first stomach is full, the only way that material can get out of the owl is by throwing it up. So an owl produces an owl pellet and basically bleh, coughs it up out of his mouth, kind of like a cat in a hairball. Now remember the owl is not sick. It's just getting rid of food that it can't digest in its body. The cool thing is we humans, we can dissect those. We can actually look inside them and not only learn about what owls eat or what their preferred prey is, you can even learn where an owl lives just by looking at an owl pellet. Now, inside this piece of aluminum foil is an owl pellet. And it's worth noting that the pellets we have, they're actually baked and sanitized ahead of time before we dissect them. One, because we want to get rid of any bad bacteria in them. But that also means then they're safe enough for us to touch with our hands. The cool thing is, though, or I guess weird thing I should say, sometimes when we sanitize these owl pellets, they're actually cleaner than our own human hands. So some way, interesting perspective on the bacteria that we actually have on our fingers. It's always good to make sure you still wash your hands after you work with an owl pellet. Now, when somebody receives an owl pellet, I'm actually gonna uncover it so you can see what it looks like. This is from an owl we call a barn owl and they produce pellet about this size so you can see. 
And right now, it kind of looks like a clump of dirt or maybe a piece of soil. Remember, this is all of the leftover stuff that an owl can't eat. So the, the fur, I actually can already see some of the bones sticking out of it too. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you how you open and look through your owl pellet, but I actually dissected one ahead of time and I can show you some of the bones that I found inside. The cool thing is, is you're gonna always find something different in an owl pellet, no matter which one you find whether it's different bones, different animals, or multiple animals in one pellet. One cool thing I'm already seeing right now that I want to show you, though, is there's a feather on this pellet. Now, this is probably from the owl, not what it ate, but it's really cool to see that even on the outside, I don't even have to look inside the pellet, and I already found a neat discovery, so I'm going to save this feather for later, too. Now, if you guys ever dissect an owl pellet, there's a couple things you want to make sure you want to remember. One, it's always good to make sure you do this on a surface that you can clean. Two, you can also use other tools like toothpicks to help pick away fur or feathers off of bones. Or better yet, if you don't know all the bones that you find, I actually have a bone chart that I use too. And this chart that I have, what's great about it is it actually separates different kinds of animals based on the bones that we see. For example, if I find a bone that I don't really know what it is or where it's from in a pellet, I can compare it to the pictures here on my bone chart and see not only what kind of bone it is, but also what animal it might have come from. We almost always find rodents in our pellets, but depending on the species, you might find things like birds. Okay, here we go. Watch close. What I do is I take my two fingers and I actually am going to twist this pellet side to side because I don't want to break any of the bones inside. And so as I slowly twist it, what I'm doing is I'm trying to separate the owl pellet into two separate, ooh, there we go, two separate sections. And what that allows me to do is start to look inside it. Wow, you can actually see all the bones, Supergirl, that's so cool. <laughs> now, I don't actually know what kind of bones there are, but here, if I pick this apart, I can actually use my hands. One I can already see, this is actually a leg bone. You can see the socket that it goes into the hip joint in there too. I know a lot of people might think it's kind of gross to me as a scientist. I think it's very interesting. We usually say gross things are interesting because it helps us learn new stuff. But probably the best find that folks can find here in a pellet is the skull of an animal. Because if it's a mammal, we usually can identify it by the animal's teeth. And fun stuff, I actually found the part of a skull in the pellet that we just opened this guy. Now, if you find something like this, it's actually really easy to identify what kind of animal it came from. If I look at my bone chart, for example, I can actually use this bone to match the shape of something on my bone chart. And that's this. This, my friend, in my hand is the jawbone of a rodent. Now, one other way I can tell is that on this jawbone, the tooth that's on it is orange. And rodents typically have these really long front teeth, we call them incisors, and they're almost always the color orange. So if you open up your owl pellet and you see that, then you almost know for sure you have a rodent. Sometimes though, you can find multiple animals in here. So it's not like rodents are the only thing. Now I'm gonna pause for a second because I know we're gonna be out of time shortly. I'm gonna show you one other thing that I found in some of my other owl pellets, and then I wanna make sure that I take those questions that you guys have. Remember, scientists can discover and find some more questions about owls just by searching through stuff like this. This though is actually the skull of another kind of rodent that I found in a previous pellet. What's really cool is you can actually see the openings, the holes where the eyes would go. And it shows you roughly how large that rodent could be. This could be from a shrew or a mole, potentially a mouse or a small rat, perhaps, just by the size of it. Thinking of how that owl was able to swallow it whole too is amazing. Okay, I see a lot of stuff happening in the chat room, usually a lot of reactions about owl pellets. So I'm gonna pause here and I wanna make sure that I answer some of your questions. Okay. Glennis, that was super, super cool. So Evan wants to know why the bones don't disintegrate. That is a great question. So a lot of these bones over time, usually over years, they will disintegrate or they'll decompose. However, bones being a solid material, it's actually a lot harder to break these down than some of the 
innards, if you will, of say a mouse or a mammal. And you think of how both digestive processes or decomposing processes work, it takes a lot more time to break down the solid of something, especially if it has a really hard structure. So these bones will disintegrate over time, especially if you leave them out in the open, but it usually takes years. And most of the time, you want to make sure you have a pellet that's pretty new so you can learn about that owl as fast as you can. Good question, though. Some of these smaller bones are harder to find in pellets though, like rib bones, because they do break apart or disintegrate a lot more easily than something like the skull or a hip bone. Good question. Okay, so um, Abby and Elliot want to know, are owls rare to find in British Columbia? So British Columbia is in uh, on the West Coast and it's like a rainforest there. So yeah, yeah. so um, probably the owls we hear about the most on the West Coast are actually barred owls, the one that we saw today you can find in British Columbia. But there's another owl that we talk about called the spotted owl, which funny enough, looks a lot like barred owls, only they're a little smaller. The weird thing though, is that barred owls didn't used to live on the West Coast. What they did is they slowly traveled through Canada around the Rocky Mountain ranges and then got to the West Coast over time. And because the barred owls are larger than spotted owls, they're actually starting to take over spotted owl habitats that we can find in both Washington and British Columbia. In fact, it's weird because you actually have to try to get rid of one owl so you can find more of another owl there. But spotted owls and barred owls are the ones we hear about the most in that area. Great question. Okay, and I it is would that include the Yukon, which would be just directly north of BC and beside Alaska? That's a great question. From what I know, or from what I understand, at least when we compare um, species that we find here in Michigan, which is what I know a little more about, um, you can find barred owls that far up north. The other one, though, that has a very wide range is um, an owl called the Great Horned Owl. It's probably our most widely distributed owl that we have in North America. Just because it's not as picky about its habitat, this is one that people actually can find in their backyards eating different rodents or small mammals. Uh, it's a little larger than a, a barred owl. It typically has these big ear tufts on the top of its head. Okay, and Angela wants to know how many owl species are there? Oh man, last time I checked in the world, there were over 210 species of owls. But note that sometimes not all species are recorded and that there's probably hundreds more that we don't even know about yet that we haven't even found in some habitats. Here in Michigan specifically, we have 10 native species, which is actually a lot, it's a lot of diversity. But knowing that there are hundreds around the world just means that there's a lot of cool diversity and different things that we can study about owls that make them so unique. Same thing with other raptors too. Cool. And how many eggs do owls lay? Uh, um, who asked that one? Question. On average, owls can lay between about one to four eggs in what's called their clutch or every year or so. Typically two eggs is pretty good for an owl. That's the average uh, amount and they lay their eggs once a year. So only a couple just once a year. And then another question is how many bones does an owl have in his body? Ooh, great question. So it's funny, a lot of scientists don't typically count all the bones to record them, but on average, around 80 bones or 80 individual bones we can find. That includes different jaw bones, their beak, um, chest bones, their sternum, tail bones, and more. Awesome. So I think that's all the questions, and I'm really glad that the students had a chance to ask because we're like right on perfect time. Thanks so much, Lannis, for showing us the two awesome owls and then the pellets and showing the magical, like how um, the feathers work. That was really fabulous. And um, we'll definitely have you back soon. Oh, look at that. <laughs> you love playing with those. And you can keep dissecting it now that it's here. Part yeah. of the thing is people can actually order these online and you can dissect yeah. the owl pellet right at your house. Okay. So That's awesome. Everybody. everybody have a session on stress coming up with Lee. Everybody loves Lee the same way we love Lannis and the solar system and yoga. And tomorrow we have to, um, an astronaut and the puppet show, like lots wow. going on connected north at home. 
so we'll cool. see you guys soon. Thanks, Lannis, and we'll be yeah. in touch. That was amazing. That was amazing. That was so good. Thanks, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. You too. Thanks. Okay, take care.